All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, today we're gonna be starting section 11.2, which is all about series. So we, we're gonna move on to series and then that's gonna like dominate the rest of the chapter. Um, hopefully you've seen a little bit about series before. You're kind of just adding up the terms of a sequence, but we're going to be concerned about what happens to these series and where they go and if they converge or not. So let's get started. All right, 11.2, uh, here's the overview. I'm going to very, very quickly talk about the properties of exponents because it turns out that we need them a lot in this chapter. Uh, we're going to get the definition of a series, which you've seen before, uh, geometric series, which you've seen before, uh, then convergence of geometric series. Then we'll talk about divergence and then finish off with linearity of convergent series, which is a, just a really handy property to have. Um, this one should not be as long as the last lecture, so thank you again for bearing with that one. This one should be a little bit quicker, but there's a lot of um, a lot of deep theory still. So please ask questions in the future uh, when we meet. All right. So first off, just a review: the properties of exponents get used all the time in this chapter, and all the time when you're dealing with series. So it's really, really important that you're comfortable with the properties of exponents. I have them all listed here, so you're welcome to skim over them and refresh your memory. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on them, but you do need to be very, very comfortable with these properties. We're going to use them a lot, okay? Uh, I can give you more examples when we meet, but just make sure you're comfortable with the properties of exponents. Okay, let's start with the definition. So an infinite series, or just a series as it's often called, is an infinite summation. So we're going to add up infinitely many things. We denote it using the sigma notation. So this is the Greek letter sigma. And a sub n is some sequence that depends on the index. And we're going to add up all of those sequence terms. Uh, sometimes when we don't need to emphasize the index and we're, we're, we understand that it's going to go on to infinity, we will just drop the notation and write that. But you uh, should be careful dropping the notation and writing that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, so after that, we can talk about a partial sum. So a partial sum of a sequence is a finite truncate. I'm sorry, a partial sum of a series is a finite truncation of the series. So basically, if you've got an infinite series that was going to infinity, uh, I'll say i equals one to infinity here, a sub i, and you decide to chop that series off at some point so that you're not adding up infinitely many, we call that a partial sum. And we denote it like so. Uh, let me get my laser pointer. So notice now the series is stopping at n. So we can call that partial sum s sub n, s sub n, and it stops right there. All right. Uh, here are some examples of partial sums. Uh, let me do this. Okay, there we go. Here are some examples of partial sums. So s1 would be <laughs> adding up all the terms from 1 to 1. So you just get the first term. S2 is adding up all the terms from 1 to 2, so you get A1 plus A2. S3 is adding up all the terms from 1 to 3, so you get A1 plus A2 plus S3, and so on. And Sn is adding up all the terms from 1 to n. There you go. So that's what S sub n is. That's what, that's what the partial sum is. Now, what's important about this is that the partial sums form a sequence. So if you listed out the partial sums, you get a sequence. And what we just talked about in the last section was if these sequences converge, for example. Okay, so let's try this example and we're going to expound upon this one throughout this, this lesson here. Um, let's write 0.9999999 dot 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 <laughs> as a series. Here we go. Uh, we can split it up and we can write it as uh, the sum of a bunch of terms. So you've probably seen this before, uh, 0.9 plus 0 0.09 plus 0 0.009 plus 0 0.0009. Add all those up and you get 0.9999999, right? All right, so writing these decimals in fraction form, we get 9 tenths, 9 hundredths, 9 thousandths, 9, nine ten thousandths. And then we can write it like this using sigma notation. There you go. Uh, notice that the numerator is always a nine here. So that's why the numerator is a nine. And the denominator is always a power of 10. 10 to the one, 10 squared, 10 cubed, 10 to the fourth. So in general, that's the pattern of the sequence. 
and we're going to add all those terms up. Okay. All right. Uh, let's look at the partial sums. So let's just write out a couple of the partial sums. The first partial sum is just 0 0.9. <laughs> the second partial sum is 0 0.9 plus 0 0.09, which is 0 0.99. The third partial sum is 0.999. <laughs> and so you get this sequence of partial sums. Uh, S sub n is 0.9999999 n many times. That's what you get. So if you write out the sequence of partial sums for this particular series, you get 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 0. Point, oops, <laughs> that's a typo, <laughs> 0 0.9999. So the question is, does this sequence converge? And if so, what does it converge to? We're going to find out in a few minutes. OK, so let's get another definition here. So what do we mean when we say that a series is convergent or divergent? Uh, here's how we do it. We do it with partial sums. So let's say we're given a series. We're going to let s sub n denote its nth partial sum. So it's when you chop the series off at n. OK, it stops at n. And here's how we define a convergent series. If the sequence of partial sums is convergent, so in other words, the limit of those partial sums is some number, then we say that the series is convergent. And we write that the series adds up to the number s, or more concisely, like so. So when we say that a series is convergent, what we mean is the sequence of partial sums is convergent. And then because of the completeness axiom, we can say that the sum is actually a number. It is a real number. And because and, we're working with the real numbers, it's a real number. Um, the number that they add up to is what's called the sum, which is a good name. <laughs> it's the sum of the series. Uh, if the sequence of partial sums does not converge, then we say that the series is divergent. So it may be the case that you add up these numbers and you don't get a finite number. You might get infinity. You might get negative infinity. You might get nothing. You might just get something that never actually adds up to anything. That's divergence. Convergence means you converge to a number, that when you add these things up, you get a number. All right? OK. Um, oh, oh, so this is the definition. Oh, oh, I just wrote it in a more concise way. So in other words, a series converges if and only if its sequence of partial sums converges. So in other words, um, this. There you go. OK. All right, so now let's talk about telescoping series. So telescoping series are actually very nice because we can determine what they converge to a lot of times. Um, and when we can do that, it's really, really nice. <laughs> uh, so a telescoping series is a series whose general term, t sub n, can be written as a difference. It can be written as a sub n minus a sub n plus one, where these are the two, these are two consecutive terms in the sequence. Okay, we're gonna see an example in just a, a moment on the next slide. Um, but with a telescoping series, because the terms can be written as this difference, you get a whole bunch of a whole bunch of cancellations, as we're gonna see in a minute. Because if, like, for example, if T1 is A1 minus A2, T2 is A2 minus A3. But then when you add T1 plus T2, what you get is A1 minus A2 plus A2 minus A3. And then here you can see that A2 cancels. And what we're left with is A1 minus A3. Right, so that's what a telescoping series looks like. The it's almost like the intermediate terms end up canceling each other out, and you're just left with the first and the last term, or some some combination of like terms that are left over at the end. Um, this technique in general, where you're canceling part of each term with part of the next term, is called the method of differences. So just generally speaking, it's this is called the method of differences. All right, let's see it in action. Here we go. We're going to show that this series is convergent, and we're going to find its sum. And we're going to dig up a, a technique that we learned back in chapter 7 for this, all right? So what I want you to do is just think about how you might show it's convergent first. So just ponder it for a minute. <clears throat> all right, now let's do this one together. And the technique that we're going to dig up is partial fraction decomposition. 
<laughs> partial fraction decomposition. So this term right here, the terms of the sequence, it's a it's one over a product, right? And we saw back in chapter seven that you can decompose these fractions into simpler fractions, into partial fractions. So if you go through the decomposition process, if I'll re refresh your memory real quick, you can say a one over n times n plus one is equal to a over n plus b over n plus one, and then you solve for a and b. And when you do that, you'll find that a is equal to one and b is equal to negative one. There we go. So this, let me get my highlighter here. This expression is equal to this expression. So in other words, this is kind of like, this is a T sub N and this is A sub N minus A sub N plus one. That's what's going on here. So if you can decompose it, now let's look at the partial sums, right? Now let's look at the partial sums. Um, so here, let me get my laser pointer. All right, so here's the nth partial sum. We're gonna add up the terms from I equals one to N. And we just showed that this sequence can be written as this sequence instead. And now I'm just gonna literally long form write out some of the terms. So here's when I is one, you get one minus one half. Here's when I is two, here's when I is three, here's when I is N. And what you can see is that you're gonna get all this cancellation. So all these terms on the inside drop out. And what you're left with at the end is just one minus one over N plus one, like so. Now, because of the definition, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the definition of an infinite sequ or infinite series, we can say that this infinite series here is equal to the limit of its partial sums. But we just showed that the form of its partial sums is this. So we just need to compute the limit of this sequence, and we will know what this thing converges to. And that's what I'm doing right here. The limit of the partial sums is the limit of this sequence. Well, this piece goes to zero and you're left with one, so the limit is one. There you go. And altogether, we have this, that this series adds up to the number one. So if you wanted to write that series out, it would add up to the number one. Maybe I'll do that up here just for, a, just for brevity, I suppose. Um, so the first term is one over one times one over, times one over one times two, one half, one over two times three, one sixth, one over three times four, one twelfth, one over four times five, one twentieth. And if you add all those up, you get one. <laughs> there you go. That's what we just proved, that that adds up to the number one. Right, cool stuff. All right, now we're gonna talk about some very, very important sequences and series. So again, I'm hoping this is a tiny bit of a refresher, but if not, we're gonna review it right now. So a geometric sequence, geometric sequence is a sequence of this form. A, A times R, A times R times R, A times R times R times R, <laughs> and you just keep multiplying by R. That's a geometric sequence. Uh, this term A, that's called the initial term, the first term, and R is what we call the common ratio. The common ratio, it's the, it's the number that you keep multiplying by to get the next term in the sequence. So to get the next term in the sequence, you keep multiplying by R. So times R, times R, times R, times R. That's why it's called the common ratio, all right? Now, a geometric series is a series of this form. So a geometric series is what you get when you add up the terms of a geometric sequence. Okay, so don't get those two mixed up. There's a difference between sequences and series, but we use sequences to explore series and what they converge to. So a geometric series is what you get when you add up all the terms of a geometric sequence. That's what's going on here. You add them all up written in a compact way is this or this. And again, this is the same thing as the index shift that we saw before. So I kind of re, rewrote that here. Um, what's happening between these two steps is an index shift. Here the index starts at one, here the index starts at zero. 
you're allowed to perform an index shift. You just got to remember that it'll affect all of the, the terms that have N involved. So you got to be careful about how they how that affects those terms. Um, and, and just like before, A is called the initial term and R is called the common ratio. So that's still the same as before. All right, uh, here are some examples. So one over two to the N, this is actually a geometric series and we can say it's a geometric series because we can put it into that form. So if I do some algebraic massage, you'll see that I get the form of a geometric series. So I can rewrite one over two to the N as one half to the N. I can factor out a one half and write this. And then this is exactly the form of a geometric series. A times R to the N minus one, N equals one to infinity. So here A is equal to, oops, uh, R is equal to one half and A is equal to one half. Now, one thing I'm gonna pause on for just a minute here is this algebraic manipulation that I did right here. Because in my experience, I know a lot of students uh, str struggle with this at first glance and then they kind of pick up on it. Um, what I did here was I took one half to the N and I factored out a one half. So I get one half times one half to the N minus one. And uh, sometimes it helps if, you, if I emphasize that this is one half to the power of one, right? And so if I were to re-multiply these together, I would get one half to the N. That's what's going on here, just FYI. There we go. Uh, really what, what I'm doing is I'm adding a clever zero. It's that technique of adding a clever zero. Great. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, now we need a little bit of a lemma here. So uh, you can get a formula, a closed form for the partial sum of a geometric sequence. Um, a lemma is basically just a, it's like a small technical result that you use in a larger theorem um, that's why I called this a lemma. So we're going to show that the formula for the partial sums of a geometric sequence is this right here. So here's the setup. Um, let, let A sub I be a geometric sequence, initial term A, common ratio R. We're going to suppose that R is not equal to zero or one in this case. All right. <laughs> um, then the first n terms of this sequence, I'm sorry, the first, <laughs> the, the nth partial sum of this sequence is given by this formula right here. So if you chop off the, se I said sequence again, geez, the nth partial sum of the series, <laughs> if you chop off the series at n, this will be the form of the partial sum. And that's what we're going to prove right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. All right, so here's the proof. Um, we're going to start with our partial sum, right? So yeah, this piece right here. So start with this partial sum. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of this partial sum by R. So here we go. Multiply both sides of that by R. And what you get is this, right? You see how you get R times SN a times r, this becomes a r squared, this becomes a r cubed. Here we had n minus one r's, now we've got n of them because we multiplied by one r. Same technique we were just looking at a moment ago. Um, all right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract the second equation from the first. So we're just gonna subtract those two and we get this. So subtracting this line, we're gonna get a whole bunch of really, really nice uh, cancellation. Look what happens here. Uh, AR minus AR, AR squared minus AR squared, dot, 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 <laughs> AR N minus one, AR N minus one. And so what you're left with is A minus AR to the N on the right side. On the left side, you're left with SN minus RSN. And that is exactly what this says. All right, cool. Now, because we're looking for a closed form for the partial sum, we're going to solve for SN. We're going to solve for SN. So factor out an A over here, factor out an SN over here, and we get this line. Divide both sides by 1 minus R, and you get the conclusion right there. Voila. All right. This is great. <laughs> this is great because if you want to know what the nth partial sum of a geometric series is, you get this for R not equal to 1 and R not equal to 0. 
that's what you get. Okay. Right. Um, now, all right, let me check something here. Convergence of the series. Let me follow my argument here. Yes. Okay. So we're going to use that lemma because what we want to know is how these geometric series converge, right? So we talked about the partial sum of a sequence of a geometric sequence. Oh my gosh. That's the issue. That's why I keep messing up the words. This should be series. There we go. My apologies. I'll change that in the slides. Mm, let's see, where else do I do it? Yes. My apologies. See, even I'll mess these words up. It's okay if you mess up the words, just don't mess up the definitions. There we go. <laughs> Partial sum of a geometric series. There we go. Well, I mean, I guess you could call it a, say, a sequence still, because you're just adding up the things. Ah, I'll change it to series so it's not so confusing. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's look at the convergence of these series. Uh, let's start with a geometric series. And we're going to suppose first that r is equal to 1, because we just want to explore how these things converge. Well, if r is equal to 1, then the partial sums are given by this. Right, that's the partial sum. And so if you remember from maybe a pre-calc class or an algebra class, this is just adding up the number a n many times. So in other words, that's n times a. But n times a just goes to plus or minus infinity depending on the sign of a. So it diverges. It diverges. In other words, your geometric series diverges if r is equal to 1. That's the conclusion there. So if r is equal to 1, your geometric series diverges. Done. All right. Now, using that lemma that we just proved, we know that a formula for the nth partial sum of the series is given by this. Now, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then by a previous theorem in the last lecture, in the last slides, 11.1, .1, we know that r to the n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. This is why we needed that result about sequences in the last section. So remember, if the common ratio, or if r, is less than 1 in size, then r to the n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So check out this result. Uh, if this series does converge, <laughs> then we can write it as some number s. And that number s is equal to the sum of this series. But that no, the sum of that series is defined as the limit of the partial sums. We have a formula for the partial sums. S sub n is this formula right here. So we're going to take the limit of this sequence and see where it goes. Excuse me. Uh, massaging just a little bit, we can split this up into two terms. Uh, both of these limits actually exist. <laughs> so we can take the limit inside, and when we do, this piece goes to zero. That's what's happening right here. Limit of this is just that again, a over one minus r. But as r to the n goes to zero, this whole term goes to zero. And so we're just left with a over one minus r. There we go. As a result, we get this theorem. We know that our geometric series is convergent if the size of r is less than one. And we know what it converges to, which is amazing. It converges to a over 1 minus r. That's it. Um, I find it easiest to remember this formula by noting that a is the first term of the series, and then r is the common ratio. So yeah, because <laughs> here, you, you got to make sure that this is the right structure. So I, I, I performed an index shift earlier to show that you could write this in different ways. If you want to claim or if you want to use this formula, this series has to be in this form. And sometimes that can be a little bit messy to do. All you really got to remember is that this is the first term of the series over 1 minus r. Uh, let me see. One note. Do I say? I think I say this in another lecture, so I'll save it there. I'll just make this one little extra note. It's really, really nice that we know what this converges to. It's really nice that we know what it converges to, because oftentimes it's hard to find what things converge to. Okay. All right. This is one I want you to practice on your own, okay? So is this series convergent or not? Think about it for a minute.
right? <clears throat> and now say something out loud, maybe a, a guess if you think it converges or not. All right, now what I want you to do is I want you to try to uh, massage this algebraically and see if you can get it into a helpful form that will tell you a little bit about its convergence or divergence. Try that. Okay, now let's do it together. Uh, first off, um, I don't know if it's convergent or divergent at first glance, but I do see a lot of powers and exponentials, so it makes me think geometric series. It may be a geometric series, and if it is a geometric series, we'll be able to tell right away if it's convergent or not. So what I need to do now is I need to massage this sequence so that it becomes the form of a geometric series or the terms of a geometric series. So here we go. Uh, at this point, this is pure algebra. And in particular, it is pure properties of exponents. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to throw those up at the beginning of the, the, the lecture here in the slides. You've got to be comfortable with properties of exponents because you're going to use them a lot. So I'll explain in detail what I'm doing at each step. Just know that this is a process that you are going to do a lot in this chapter. So starting here, um, I'm going to write 3 to the 2n as 3 squared to the n, and 5 to the 1 minus n as 5 to the negative n minus 1. Right? Now I'm going to move things around a bit. So 3 squared is 9. And because this exponent is negative, I can move this entire factor into the denominator here. Now it's starting to starting to kind of resemble what could be a geometric series, right? Um, let's see, what else? Well, I've got an n minus 1 down here. And the form of a geometric series has an n minus 1 for the exponent. So maybe I need to rewrite this in terms of n minus 1. So what I'm going to do is the same technique that I did earlier. I'm going to factor out a 9 from this and rewrite 9 to the n as 9 times 9 to the n minus 1. OK, now I'm going to combine these factors here because we've got 9 to the n minus 1 over 5 to the n minus 1. Properties of exponents says we can write that like so. And now, boom, check it out. This is exactly the form of a geometric series. There's an initial term, and there's a common ratio. The initial term is 9. The common ratio is 9 fifths, but because 9 fifths is greater than 1, this series diverges. Diverges. So this series does not converge. It, it just keeps going. It adds up to infinity, goes to infinity as you keep adding. All right. OK. Now let's do this one. Now let's do this one. But I want you to do this one on your own, OK? So um, let me throw up the thinker. Think about this. Uh, remember, we were looking at it earlier, right? And now what I want you to do is I want you to massage this into the form of a geometric series and then see if it converges. And if so, what does it converge to? Go for it. Try it on your own. <clears throat> All right. Now let's do it together. Uh, just needs a little bit of algebraic massage. Um, uh, here we go. I rewrote 9 over 10 to the n as 9 over 10 times 1 over 10 to the n minus 1. Basically, I rewrote 10 to the n as 10 times 10 to the n minus 1. You see that technique a lot, right? Uh, 9 is just 9. But now I can rewrite this part as 1 tenth to the n minus 1. And now I've got the form of a geometric series. So it is a geometric series. And because it's a geometric series, we know if it converges or not. Uh, first term is 9 tenths. Common ratio is 1 over 10. So it does converge. It converges because the size of the common ratio is less than 1. We also know that it sums up to that number. That's it. So behold, <laughs> the number 0.9999999 repeating is equal to this by what we proved earlier today, which is 9 tenths over 9 tenths, which is 1. It is 1. <laughs> and again, these are all equalities. And you all know how I feel about the equal sign. 0.999 forever is equal to 1. 
It's not close to one. It's not about one. It's not almost one. It is equal to one. It's equal to one. So now when people go on to Facebook or whatever and start complaining, this argument pops up like every two months on Facebook. Like everyone's telling me 0.9999 forever is equal to one. It can't be. It is. It is. It 100% is. And we just proved it right now, right here. All right. <laughs> um, there you go. So 0.99 repeating is equal to one. And there's the proof. Okay. Um, now that we've talked about convergence, let's talk about divergence. Because uh, we, not every series converges. Some series diverge, and we want to explore divergence and convergence, all of it, right? So let's use this example. And I'm going to give you um, a proof that, well, we're going to see if it converges or diverges, but we're going to prove it using some of the techniques that I mentioned at the beginning of section 11.1's lecture, uh, basically looking at inequalities and thinking about the size of things. So let's look at the series first. This series right here is one of the most important series in math. It's called the harmonic series. It is the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers. So in particular, this is equal to 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth forever, the harmonic series. Let's determine if it converges or diverges. Actually, let me, uh, let me let you ponder it for a minute. Yeah, ponder it for a minute. See, uh, do you think it converges or do you think it diverges? What do you think? All right, now say it out loud. Say if you think it converges or diverges, tell your friend, tell your dog, let them know your, your guess and then we'll see what it is. Right, here we go. Um, one thing I'll start with is that uh, we can't use the, the theorems that we just proved and used about geometric series because this is not a geometric series. Notice that it is not of the form of a geometric series. So that theorem is not useful here. We can't use it at all. It doesn't satisfy the hypotheses of that theorem. So that theorem is out. What are we gonna do instead? Well, sometimes it helps to look at some partial sums and get an idea of the pattern. And that's what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna pick out some particular partial sums just to emphasize the pattern. So first I'm gonna look at S2. Oops, S2. Look at the, uh, the sum of the first two terms, one plus one half. Then I'm gonna look at S4. And S4 is adding up the first four terms. And you'll see why I picked S4 in just a minute. Um, this value is strictly greater than this value right here. So what I did was I replaced one third with one fourth. One third is greater than one fourth. So if I add a bunch of stuff up with one third and instead add that stuff up with one fourth, I get a bigger number. I get a bigger number. So that means that this thing is bigger than this thing but this thing we can simplify and it becomes one over one plus two over two. One plus two over two. Okay, now I'm gonna compute the eighth partial sum. So the eighth partial sum is what you get when you add up eight, the first eight terms. So here are the first eight terms. We're gonna add them all up and I'm gonna use a, um, a similar technique as I did just a moment ago. So I'm going to replace one third with one fourth. And then I'm gonna replace, let me get a different color, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh with one eighth, one eighth, one eighth. And in doing so, what I get is an inequality. So I get that the eighth partial sum has to be bigger than this value, but this value is easy to simplify. When you add all the stuff up, oops, let me uh, do this. When you add all the stuff up, you get one plus this, which adds up to three halves. All right, now there's a pattern here. Look, S sub two is one plus one half. S sub four is one plus two halves. S sub eight is one plus three halves. And so maybe in general, you can see what the general result is going to be. In general, we have that S sub two to the N is greater than or equal to one plus n over two. Okay, let me emphasize one thing here. This is, oops, this is s 
sub two to the n. So what we're looking at is the, uh, the two to the nth partial sum. All right, now check this out. The limit as n goes to infinity of the right-hand side here is infinity. It's infinity, right? Because as n goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. So this whole thing goes to infinity, that's infinity. But also <laughs> this, the, <laughs> this, uh, this partial sum is greater than that number. So this is kind of like a squeeze theorem argument, but not quite. It's because uh, nothing's getting squeezed. This is more of like a pushing, things are getting pushed. So because we know this is greater than this, it means that the limit of this has to be greater than the limit of this one, which is infinity. So in other words, the limit of this sequence of partial sums is infinity. We just showed that the limit of this sequence is infinity, but the sequence of partial sums for our series, S sub n, is strictly contained in this sequence of partial sums. So we just showed that the sequence of partial sums for the harmonic series goes to infinity. Or in other words, the harmonic series diverges. The harmonic series diverges. So this is a... Uh, uh, this is a pretty interesting result because this is saying that if you add up all of the reciprocals of the positive integers, that it will add up to infinity. It'll go to infinity. So it's almost like these, uh, this sequence here, the sequence is not getting small. It's not getting small enough fast enough. And you keep adding up these numbers. And when you add them all up, you get infinity. All right. So the harmonic series is divergent. That is a classic result. Um, man, I should state it as a, as a theorem. I should do that. Maybe I'll change the slides later for that. Um, but the, the harmonic series is divergent. It's divergent. All right. So now let's see what's going on here in a more general way. Um, because there's something interesting here. The fact that we add these up and still get infinity is a little bit perplexing because the numbers are decreasing. Like it's a decreasing sequence, one over n goes to zero. But when you add those numbers up, you still get infinity, which is kind of bizarre. Um, let's explore a theorem that's gonna talk or tell us about the relationship between a series and its sequence, okay? So here is the result and the direction of implication is critically important here. So pay very close attention to this. If the series, sorry, if the series converges, then the limit of the sequence of terms is zero. Okay, so if your series converges, then the sequence comprising the terms must converge to zero. And I want you all to think about this for a minute. Just ponder it, read it in your head a couple times. Okay, and then I want you to say it out loud to yourself and uh, be careful with the implication and the words that you're using. So say it out loud. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some cautionary notes about this and then we're gonna use this to get a very helpful theorem. So this is just a repeat of the theorem. Uh, and, and again, it says this, it says, if the series, if the series converges, then the sequence converges. So if the series converges, then the, the sequence terms go to zero go to zero in particular, not just converges, but goes to zero. Um, and here's the important note. A lot of times students will accidentally reverse the direction of implication here. The converse of this, of this statement is false. The converse says, uh, if this limit is zero, then the series converges. That is not the case. That is totally false, totally false, and it's not true. So be very, very careful. Don't mix up the direction of implication. Just because the sequence goes to zero, that does not mean that the series converges. And the classic counterexample is the harmonic series. Look, the harmonic series, this, the sequence itself goes to zero. One over n goes to zero. But we just proved that the series diverges. So in other words, just because the sequence of terms goes to zero, it doesn't mean that the series will converge. So be very, very careful with that. 
Okay, the converse is false. The converse is false. Um, this one, what am I? Yes, okay, this one. So now let's prove this theorem. So this theorem says that, hey, if your series converges, then it must be the case that the terms go to zero. That's what it's saying. If your series converges, the terms must go to zero. Let's prove that. And here's the proof. We're supposing the series converges. So in other words, that means there is some real number S such that the sequence of partial sums of the series converges to S. That's by definition, right? That's the definition of convergence. Now, what is S sub N? That's just adding up the first N terms of the series. What's S sub N minus one? That's adding up the first N minus one terms of the series. Now, using the same kind of technique we did before, the same little trick, uh, if we subtract these two things, we get that A sub N equals S sub N minus S sub N minus one right here. All right, there we go. All right, <laughs> now, because we know that S sub N goes to S, in other words, the sequence of partial sums converges to S, it also means that S sub N minus one converges to S. So if you perform an index shift, you're still gonna get convergence to S. So consequently, the limit of A sub N is equal to the limit of S sub N minus S sub N minus one, but both of these limits exist and they're both equal to S. So we get S minus S, which is zero. So the limit of the terms is zero and now we're done, we proved it. So once again, if the series converges, then the terms have to go to zero. That's what that's saying. All right. What's helpful about this theorem is it's contrapositive, and this contrapositive yields a very handy theorem that we call the divergence test, or the test for divergence. So the, actually, you know what? I should hide this for a minute. You tell me what the contrapositive is. So <laughs> let me go, go back to this. Pretend you didn't see that slide for a minute. Look at, this, uh, look at this statement and see if you can say out loud, here we go, I'm throwing it up. See if you can say out loud the contrapositive of that statement. Go for it. Okay, <laughs> now let's look at the theorem. Let's look at the contrapositive. It says this, it says, hey, if the limit of the sequence does not go to zero, then your series is divergent, which is really, really handy. <laughs> it's just really, really handy. So this is saying that if, uh, if the terms do not go to zero, then your series must be divergent must be divergent. So that's a pretty powerful result because if you have a hunch that the, the, the terms of the series aren't going to zero, then you can show that the series diverges perhaps without too much work. You just got to compute this limit. So let's practice right now. Here we go. I want you to try it on your own and then we'll do it together in a minute. Uh, let me get this here. Okay, so show that this series diverges. So think about what you would do first. Now say out loud what you're going to do. And now go for it. Remember, if you're computing a limit, you need to write your calculation as a chain of true equalities using the limit operator correctly. Go for it. All right, now let's look at it together. Um, if I want to show this series diverges, a good place to start is to look at the limit of the terms. So we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of those terms. And here's what it looks like. Uh, limit of this, classic limit technique, classic limit that you explored back in Calc 1, divide by the highest power term, or highest power, yeah, the highest power, and you get this. All right, but then when we take the limit, this goes to 1 half. 1 half is not 0. Therefore, the series diverges by the test for divergence. And that's the conclusion. All right, so that's a really, really handy theorem, the divergence test. All right, on that note, one last slide. <laughs> I guess I didn't recompile the slides. Oh yeah, there we go. I didn't re recompile the slides enough. Um, almost last note, uh, one last little bit. 
uh, right at the end, we have linearity of convergent series. So just like we had with sequences, we can talk about uh, linearity of convergent series. But once again, the critically important bit is that they have to be convergent. They have to be convergent. Remember, convergence is equivalent to saying a limit exists. So these don't apply unless the limit exists. All right. And I have a little note about that, a little slight proviso, but here it is. If you've got convergent series, then the sum, I'm sorry, the, the, the series of the sum or difference is equal to the sum or difference of the series. So you can split convergent series over sums and differences if they're convergent. Also, you can pull out constant multiples. That's what this is saying. So if you have a, a sequence and you know that or if you have a sequence and you multiply it by a constant multiple, you can pull that constant multiple out of the series and it's still true. You still get equality, right? Uh, this one is a little more flexible. So I have this note. It turns out that this part of linearity still holds if your series is divergent, as long as C is not zero. So you get a little bit of flexibility there, right? And then the very last thing I'll say is this before we call it a day. Um, this note, nota bene, a finite number of terms does not affect convergence or divergence. So when we're talking about convergence and divergence of a series, we are talking about the tail of the series. So if you chop off the first part of the series, chop off the first 20 terms, that's not going to affect the convergence at all because there are infinitely many terms after that. Those are what determine convergence and divergence. So you can chop it off at any finite stage you want, and that doesn't affect convergence or divergence. Even if you chop off the first trillion terms, there's infinitely many terms after that. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you chop off a finite number of terms. All right. Now on that note, let's play. Yeah, I forgot to recompile my slides. My apologies. Um, all right, so that's it for the beginning of series. We're going to explore these series a lot more. And for the next, oh, geez, I think five or six sections, we're going to get a whole bunch of theorems about if these series converge, if these series diverge, and all these little helpful theorems to help us determine if these series converge or diverge. All right, so thank you again for listening and bearing with it all. I'll see you next time.